There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. According to Adrian Wojnarowski, the Bucks have been in serious discussion about boycotting tonight's game. NBA officials have gone into the Milwaukee locker room. So as we know, the shooting of Jacob Blake took place in the state of Wisconsin. Milwaukee has opened up in their press conferences, as seen earlier in this show, about how impactful that shooting has been on their organization. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's Brian H. Waters here. Welcome to this edition of Breaking Through Glass Ceilings with Uncomfortable Conversations. Today, I'm really excited as uh, this is the first time I'm doing an in-person interview or discussion, and it's somebody who means the world to me, my self-adopted grandfather, I call him Pop. He's the one and only Deacon Lorenzo Coleman of the Christian Memorial Church. Uh, we like to call him our walk in history. <laughs> and that's with the utmost respect, of course. Pop, how you feeling today? I'm doing well. First of all, thanks for having me. Move up closer to the mic. <laughs> First of all, I'm doing well. And thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate this as we go through uh, years and years and months of things that Hopefully I can help somebody. Yeah, so, um, you know, I was sitting here looking at, it's been a uh, trying week this week, or I should say last week by the time this airs, and we've seen sports players essentially become activists. And I thought about you, and I wanted to have you on here because I know you've seen so much throughout the years, uh, but you've also you taught me a lot of history that, we haven't learned in the classroom and this week uh, or I should say last week we saw the unfortunate shooting of a young man by the name of Jacob Blake and police officers shot him in the back seven to eight times and NBA players you know they've been part of the reason they went to the bubble and with the messages because they wanted to make sure that people realize that we as black people aren't being treated fairly so then when the uh, protesters were out there, there was a young white boy about an age, at the age of 17 who shot and killed two people. And that made the athlete say enough is enough. As somebody who's been on this earth, you can reveal your age if you want to. How did it make you feel to see these athletes take this type of stand? Well, it made me feel good. I'm 78 years old. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I've been have seen a whole lot. It made me feel good to see the black athletes and even the white ones who are standing with them to stand up about things that are happening. You know, I was sitting here thinking uh, yesterday they celebrated Jackie Robinson Day, and which is great because Jackie stood up for a lot. And also uh, it's good to see these guys who are standing up and saying enough is enough and we're tired. And the only way to do this is to step aside and say, I'm just not going to play. If you go back further, years and years ago, a young man by the name of Kurt Flood did that, and uh, he really was out there on his own. And, of course, it, it's a different situation, but it's still the same because Kurt Flood stood up for free agency, and he was out there by himself. I'm glad to see that these athletes are stepping up. Uh, you know, Brian, I go back, and I often tell my wife, and I told my two daughters, when— uh, Donald Trump was running for president when he made the speech, I'm going to make America great again. Right away, I started thinking he wanted America to go back like it was in the 30s and 40s, where we had no say so, where if you spoke up, you were sort of kicked out of the ramification. My hat is off to these black athletes. I'm proud of them. And I'm sure some of the older athletes who played in the major leagues or NFL or NBA before them is proud of them, too. Uh, you brought up Jackie Robinson and you said we just celebrated Jackie Robinson today. Can you talk about him breaking the color barrier in Major League Baseball, but also some of the people and, you know, I have an audience with some baseball fans who are a lot younger and some sports fans who may not know that. As great as Jackie was, he wasn't 
the best in the Negro Leagues, but he was more so the chosen one. Jackie Robbins was, he was a very good baseball player in the Negro Leagues. Uh, but you had others like Josh Gibson, Oscar Charleston, Cool Papa Bell, Corsatio Page, and uh, um, names could go on Biz Markey. But Jackie was a very good uh, baseball player. Jackie came out of UCLA, you know, to go to a school like that for an African-American back then was great. He came out of UCLA, he was a football player, and he was a track star. And his brother was a big track star, Mac Robinson, at UCLA. Jackie was chosen not only because he could play. Branch Rickey was looking for someone who wouldn't fight back, who wouldn't talk back, who could stand the pressure of the racism. Now, let me say this. It's a good thing that Branch Rickey had a different pol- a, a different baseball commissioner back then because before, uh, I think it was Happy Chandler who was commissioner back then. Before Happy Chandler was a guy out of Kentucky called Kennesaw Mountain Lannis, who was a judge. He was the one that said, in so many words or less, that baseball, Major League Baseball, would stay white. So along come Branch Rickey, who was president of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and I think Happy Chandler was the commissioner then. And remember, Branch Rickey did this without the other owners knowing he had got himself together. He had a scout to go scout Jackie. He went to see Jackie for himself. And they sit down and talk. Jackie Robinson had signed the contract to be in professional Major League Baseball way before he made his debut, before Branch Rickey announced it. And he and he picked the right guy because he needed someone who would just take it and just, no matter what, kept playing. But let me say this. There was a lot of people who thought Jackie wasn't going to make it. And when Jackie got into the major leagues, they had never seen nothing like that. A guy who could run fast, a guy who could hit, a guy who could steal bases. He, as far as I'm concerned, revolutionized the game in a lot of ways. Not only did he make it possible for the doors to open for our black athletes in all sports, not only just just baseball, but our, in all sports for black athletes to step in and become the great ball players and the superstars there only. Jackie also, in later years, when Jackie played for La- for the Brooklyn Dodgers, Lord and Grace say Los Angeles, for the Brooklyn Dodgers for 10 years, Jackie retired when the Brooklyn Dodgers traded him to the New York Giants. Rather than go there, he retired. This was a preeminence of Kurt Flood saying, you traded me, I'm not going to play. I am not a piece of meat that you can trade back and forth. Jackie retired rather than to go play for the New York Giants. You know, Kurt Flood kind of revolutionized free agency, correct? Yes, and he also spoke out about trading. Mm-hmm. And that's what it was. Kurt, Kurt Flood, I think uh, he was traded from the Cardinals to the Phillies. And he said, hey, I'm just not a piece of meat you can just send here and there. Uh, so he opts for free agency. He started, And that's when the thing started talking about free agent. Jackie just made his statement, I'm not going to play for the Giants. I'll retire. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine if he played for the Giants, him and Willie Mays? Oh, man. And Monty <laughs> Irving? Oh, my grace. And Hank Thompson. But Jackie said, hey, I'm not going to play for the New York Giants. And he retired. And uh, his education came in good because he got a job with Chalk Full of Nooks co- uh, Coffee uh, Company where he wound up being vice president. Yeah. So now, essentially, then, Kurt Flood benefited – uh, I should say white players benefited off of Kurt Flood's actions too, Oh, right? sure, sure. Because there was no free agency. If sure, no, there was no free agency. Kurt Flood kept yelling about it, kept yelling about it, kept saying, I wouldn't go. Kurt Flood gave up a baseball career to go be an artist. Mm-hmm. He was a, he's a very good artist. And he said, rather than go through this, I'm going to do something else. Like I said, Jackie Robinson gave. Jackie Robinson could have played at least 15, 16, maybe 20 years. He played 10 years and said, that's it. I'm not going to the Giants. Bingo. Uh, but, of course, we know what great things Jackie did after that, how he spoke out against things. And and it's great to see that he spoke out that to today we have had black managers in, in, um, in, the, uh, in um, Major League Baseball. We've had black coaches, you see. 
Now, as far as I know right now, you have one black executive Maybe two. And that's Kenny Williams of the Chicago White Sox. I think he's uh, general manager and vice president of the Chicago White Sox. Uh, Jackie opened the door for Frank Mm -hmm. Robinson to become manager, for Dusty Baker to become manager, for Cito Gaston, uh, who guided Toronto Blue Jays at two World Series victories, to become black managers. And even the... the, um, Hispanics players, you know, Ossie Guillen mm. uh, uh, and, and others, a lot of names you can call. Jackie opened the doors. Uh, so therefore, now, we are hoping, and I'm hoping I see in my lifetime, where there will be an African-American owning a MFL, a Major League Baseball team. Mm, yeah, me too. Uh, Magic did get a part of the Dodgers, mm-hmm. but he wasn't sole owner. D- uh, Derek Jeter is with the uh, Miami Marlins. He's one of the owners, yeah. but he's got partners. I don't think he's the sole owner, yeah. but that's a start. But I want to, hopefully I'll be able to see where an African-American can own the, the full membership, the full thing, and the same way in the NFL, and, um, you know, yeah. that will help. So, you know, I always like speaking with you about sports because you, in life in general, I should say, always know – how to adapt with the times, you know? Uh, that's why for me, it's always been easy to talk to you about anything in life. And one of the things, a few years ago, we brought up Curtis Flood. We saw LeBron James, uh, the decision when he decided to go to Miami, eventually go back to Cleveland, now with the Lakers. We saw Kevin Durant make the decision to go to the Golden State Warriors. Uh, both of those moves were criticized very heavy because the first thing people want to say is, well, you up and ran. You didn't stay and endure the franchise. How did you feel when you saw these particular moves being made? I thought they were doing what they, was, what they wanted to do and also what Kurt Flood and a lot of other people uh, had the right to do. You know what gets me? Uh, people talk about that, the LeBron James and all this, but nobody criticized the other thing. Nolan Ryan pitched for the New York Mets. Nolan Ryan pitched for the California Angels. Nolan Ryan pitched for the Houston Astros and the Texas Rangers. Nobody criticized that. Roger Clemens went from Boston to Toronto, wind up with the Yankees. Back during those days, you were, uh, if you signed a contract, that owner could tell you when and where you could go. If he didn't want to pay you the price that you felt as though you were stuck with that team Mm -hmm. or else retired. That's the difference. How many of us in life, or even on our jobs, has the, you know, if if you don't like the job, you can transfer. There's no law to say that you can't transfer from one department to another. So people criticize it, and they criticize it. We know why, because it was LeBron, because it was Kevin Durant, and what's the other with Kyrie Irving. So they criticize. But that's the way America is. My brother, Brian, still we live in America, yes. But it's still, unfortunately, black and white situation. Uh, Things can be done that, uh, uh, that somebody can do. I relate back, and, and not getting off the subject, to years ago when the, the young man up in on Park Ice Avenue was beaten in the head and killed by a white guy. Mm-hmm. This white guy got out of the country all the way to Israel. Mm-hmm. Nobody pumped that and this and that. So LeBron and these guys are to do it. Of course, it's, 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 it's opening the door. Hey. Don't you look for a raise on your job if another guy comes along and say, well, look, your contract is up. I'll offer you $6 million. You're going to stay where you are when the guy's only going to give you three? You got families to support. Mm-hmm. And in sports, what, what the people who criticize fail to understand, I retired at 62 from my job. How many athletes will retire at 52 from playing baseball, football, basketball, wrestling, or boxing? All right, so you um, you bring up living in a country that's you know pretty much black or white. I want to go back to the night, or I should say the day, night President Kennedy was killed. Was there 
when we I know that they said the sports stopped around that time. Was that just so that the country could mourn? Was there any type of activism going around there? Was there any type of protest? Or was it one of those things that people kind of knew who did it and it was what it was? Well, first of all, if the sports was cut off, I think out of uh, respect for a fallen president, uh, you must remember uh, a lot of African-American black folks loved Kennedy. And uh, and you had you had some, some whites who made dumb derogatory remarks of course, that's always going to be with some people. Uh, it was an activism back then. It was back in the 60s. You got to remember, 63, yes, it was in the height of, of the King movement. Uh, uh, people had just said, well, just what is going on? The president is assassinated. Uh, and it goes back further than that. Uh, I remember reading and looking in Life magazine uh, when I was a teenager, when uh, Franklin Roosevelt died, uh, there was people were crying, but there was some white there was some white folks who put a sign in their business closed due to the death of your nigger loving president. Wow, I'll never forget that. It was in Life magazine. So uh, uh, there was activism going on because in the civil rights, you know, we're talking about the '60s. Kennedy was assassinated in '63. Martin Luther King were getting people together. People were still. A lot of states did not allow voting. Mm -hmm. You see, did not allow voting. Uh, so they were pushing and they were pushing. And King was waking people up going on. This happened, you know. And some might believe, some might believe that it happened because of the things that he was going to remember. Kennedy was talking about the Civil Rights Act. And uh, by him being killed, Lyndon Johnson wind up signing it. You see, remember during the Kennedy thing, there was the James Meredith thing down at the University of Mississippi where they didn't want him to go. George Wallace yelling, segregation now, segregation forever. Uh, governor of Georgia, Lester Maddox, mm -hmm. who were, you know, th these people were, were, were yelling racism. They, they felt as though that we should stay in our place. And, um, you know, I had a job that I worked on one time and it, going through this, and a guy, uh, a guy said to me, well, no, if you don't like America, leave. And I said to him, why should I leave it? My ancestors did this, but said, this sweat, tears, bones died on, in, in this country. So it's just another part of mine as is of yours. You say, if you want to talk about immigrants, we all immigrants, except for the Native American, and they got them out on reservations. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what happened with, with the Kennedy thing. I feel as though that, you know, King was starting and Kennedy had begun to look into these things. He had looked into about this, this Voting Rights Act and all of that. Do you believe that had he been able to finish his term, a lot of the stuff that we're fighting for today would have been in place or would it still have been too soon? Ah, uh, well, had he lived to finish his term... Politics is politics. I think he would have tried to put a lot as long, as long as the Senate and the Congress had remained majority Democrat. Okay. Uh, a lot of people don't understand, too. Even back then, you had Democrats. They were called Dixiecrats. Oh. And most of them jumped over to the Republican Party. Oh. Dixiecrats were those who were from the South who still believed in segregation. So you don't hear that term anymore, Dixiecrats. Mm -hmm. A lot of them jumped over. Strom Thurmond, who was a Dixiecrat, jumped over to the Republican Party. And a lot of them did. Remember, George Wallace was a, Dem a Dixiecrat. <laughs> and he, two years, I think he was served eight or 12 years as governor of Alabama. Mm -hmm. So see, so that that's when all this happened. If the Congress could have stayed, could have stayed mostly Democratic, maybe he would have got some, some done, but see things were it different. It took Martin, Martin Luther King, to really get out and just let people know. Uh, if it was left up to a lot of people, it just would have been pushed under the table. You know, us just the fad, let it go. Mm. But King kept going on and on, and when he did that march on Washington, that opened up a lot of eyes from people from all race, creeds, and religion. You know, yeah. Brian, hopefully in my lifetime, things have gotten better, but we still got a ways to go. Mm -hmm. We see. So 
another question is when King died, how did, because he died in April. Mm hmm. At that time, there's, you know, NBA. And granted, the NBA was nowhere what it is today. Um, the TV deals wasn't even. I think they said a lot of games with the Lakers and Celtics were on tape delay. Uh, but baseball was, you know, prominent. Was there any activism then? Was there any uh, – were people, like, saying they wouldn't play or were they, you know, honoring him? With, like, No, a lot of people honored them on the uh, field with um – Black bands, okay. or what have you. Uh, the only activism was riots. Okay, people. No, people got fed up. I remember when it was here, mm -hmm. the, way before the Freddie Gray, uh, uh, the National Guard. He came in. I was getting off work one day. I didn't have a car, and I got on the bus, and I got off the bus at. Pennsylvania Fulton, and I was living up in Park Circuit. The bus didn't go any further, and the National Guard was bivouacked out in Drew Hill Park. And the guy asked me why I was down the street and where was I? I just got off work. It was on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I walked all the way from there, all the way up to Rock Rose Avenue up in Park Circle. So I guess the way that people protested back then or felt the hurt and shame was by uh, riots and Pennsylvania Avenue has never been the same since the riots because Pennsylvania Avenue was the hub of all black and they you had your stores your clubs and what have you mm. after that when they burnt down and um, uh, the, uh, it, 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 this is how they this is how black folk reacted you had Los Angeles you had mm. Detroit you had Newark New Jersey you see and the thing was burn baby burn yeah. and I think that that got people's attention in Washington. They, they, and believe it or not, they even had riots in Washington, D.C., but they kept it away from the White House and, and around the government buildings. So that, that was the way today and nowadays as we got older, the way to be heard is to march mm -hmm. and is to get uh, politicians in to go to the voting polls that say, hey, I'm going to get this guy out of office uh, we saw that with the president election of President Obama. Mm -hmm. I seen people in the voting lines who hadn't voted in years. So there is a way to do it. Do you remember where you was when you found out about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Yeah, I was in the grocery store. Oh, I was. Uh, uh, I I lived in Park Circle, around the corner there. Uh, there was a there was a. Pantry Pride Food Market, mm -hmm. and I lived around the corner. And it was I was going to get some groceries when I heard that the King had been assassinated. Uh, I had my two daughters with me and my wife. The girls were small, mm -hmm. and I'm saying what? And and I just felt everything just just like the life out of me had left. My heart felt sad because you know why kill a man who never harmed nobody who was only speaking out about what is right and. Um, Black America was shook up behind that, mm -hmm. you see. So, and then, um, that's, I'll never forget, when Kennedy got assassinated, I was on the bus coming home from work. Mm -hmm. And, of course, when King got assassinated, I was in the, in the store. And if I got, uh, I don't know if I got the rest of my food or what, I just turned around and went home and cut the TV on, you know, to really just find out that what really happened. And it was on and on and on. Yeah, my mom says she and my Uncle Mike was playing on the floor. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother was on the phone, and she said, "Hold on, y'all, stop playing! Like, stop making yeah, noise. Yeah, yeah. This is important." Yeah. And then she remembers seeing it come across yes, the screen. Yes, it was a it was a, a terrible day, as far as I'm concerned, in American history. Yeah, you know when when, when this man was uh, uh, assassinated. Before him, they had killed uh, Meg Evers mm -hmm. down in Mississippi. So there was a lot of things going on, all because. You know that that folks wanted the right to vote, yeah. And and my argument has always been that's why a lot of people down Muhammad Ali when he said he rather he wasn't going and they called him a traitor and all. But let me tell you this: I had an uncle in 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 the service, and I'm not knocking the army and the service. And he's told me a lot of things that uh, uh, black black soldiers didn't get mm -hmm. that the white ones got. And my theory was. You're going to tell me I don't have the right to vote, but I'm good enough when I get 18 to be drafted into the army to go fight and die if necessary. So that's something else young people don't understand. When I turned 18, you had to register for the selected service. Mm -hmm. If you didn't, you even got locked up or thrown in, in, in the service. So 
Things have changed. Uh, uh, we've made a lot of strides, but there's still some more strides to make. When I came out of uh, junior high school, the school you graduated from, City, on its way, uh, we could get in there yet have plenty of smarts. I had a couple guys in my class that went to City, but their average was real high. Mm-hmm. They did not just take, especially African American, if your average was not that high. And that's why Kurt Smoke got into City. So, and the same way with Poly in, in, in Western and in, in all these schools. And, and, and they turned out good guys. Look how you turned out. <laughs> city grad. <laughs> Baltimore City College, uh, one of the prestigious high oh, schools. For, <laughs> for I'm those. putting in the word for Frederick Douglass, senior <laughs> high school class of 1961. Yeah, uh, two great schools for those who are not familiar <laughs> um, with the Baltimore area. Um, years ago, not too long ago, probably about 20 years now, a gentleman by the name of Craig Hodges um, tried to get Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan to protest with him. Do you remember that? And how did you feel when they were reluctant? Um, he said, I, I read a quote the other day where Craig said he told, where Magic told him, like, not play, man, that's too extreme. And, you know, the other day we saw the Milwaukee Bucks say they wasn't playing, which then led to everybody else following suit. How did you feel around the time? Did it bother you? Did you feel that Magic and Michael could have had a bigger impact or... It bothered me. Uh, it's beginning, more is beginning to come out about Michael because some of the people said that he did not want to get involved in this thing. Michael was making money, and Michael was worried more so about his Madison Avenue in, uh, image, you know, with the endorsements all. Remember, during the civil rights area, Jim Brown, mm-hmm. Kareem Abdul Jubbar, who was Lou Alcindor then, uh, Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali, these guys stood up. Uh, 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 what's the other guy's name? Bernie Casey. Mm-hmm. Some of these names you don't hear about. They stood up, they sent King money, they took money, and they spoke out against it. They weren't worried about their Madison, whether I will get endorsements or not. The advertising world was strange back then. Uh, I'll give you a great example. Hank Aaron broke Babe Ruth's record. How many endorsements do you see Hank Aaron? Not that many. There you go. There you go. So Michael and them were worried about their image. You know, of course, Michael has is, is, is got the Charlotte Hornets now and a lot of other businesses. So is Magic. But back then, they were reluctant because they did not want, I'll say again, to worry. They were worried more so about their, their image. After What would happen after I don't play basketball anymore? Sometimes you just have to stay, take a stand and, hey, Whatever it is, it is. Mm-hmm. But you have to take a stand. Uh, I felt uh, I felt a little hurt. I felt a little angry. Because mm-hmm. at that time, they were the face. Yeah. You know, they were the face. You know, wow, he, he's not stepping out. He's leaving me behind, you know. So that that's how I felt. Yeah. Um, as we record this, it's less than 24 hours that a gentleman by the name of Chadwick Bozeman, we found out he passed away. Uh, he played Jackie Robinson on the movie 42. He also played Thurgood Marshall, James Brown. And for the children who are growing up, my kids get to see he was the black superhero, the black uh, Panther. Um, can you talk about what it meant to see him um, representing our people and representing some of the people that you watched in their heyday to see that come on screen because you know sometimes it can be we could be critical because we may say well it didn't really happen like this or it did happen like that but I know you said you've enjoyed uh, his work can you talk about it him? I enjoyed especially his work in 42 because it told an in-depth story that uh, about Jackie Robinson's life that a lot of people made films. They just went on about the brand Ricky and the Los Angeles Dodgers and this and that. I mean, the Brooklyn Dodgers, this and that. They had not talked about Jackie's plight in the minor leagues, you know, uh, uh, before he went to Montreal, which was the Brooklyn Dodgers AAA club. Jackie told in the minors for a couple of years. Again, you must remember, here's a black ball player going in the minor leagues teams that was in the South, little small towns, little small towns at what he went through. He stayed with a black family when he was in the South down there playing during the minor leagues. 
Uh, and I thought this portrayed well, and this young man portrayed Jackie very well with dignity. Jackie would have been proud because he said that Jackie's wife was also one of the consultants of that movie, 42. So she could tell him a lot, and I'm sure she was happy with the way that this young man portrayed her husband. And as far as Black Panther, isn't it good to see that we got that we got black guy to be superhero too? <laughs> you know, I came along Superman, you know, <laughs> leap tall buildings with a single bound and all that stuff, you know. It's good to see that some of our people, you know, and I you know, I'm uh this young man was good. It's just sorry we you know, he's gone too soon. <laughs> he has gone too soon. But I thought he did a great job and and, and was a very good actor. Yeah. It's uh, it's definitely sad, you know. Um, you never know, and the, especially to find out he was filming all this while battling um, colon cancer. Yes, yes. And uh, you know, so just the amount of, like the countless surgeries and chemotherapies he was going through in between filming sessions. That takes a lot. That's why you take your hat off to the brother. Uh, that takes a lot. That proves how also, too, that he put himself into that role and how I felt as though that he felt as though how important it was that when your kids or my grandkids see this again, and it'll be shown again, or they get it on DVD to really know what this guy went through, uh, 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 the sickness to do this role. Uh, I know what colon cancer does. I've had a relative of mine go through. In fact, my brother went through it. Thank God he is he's, he's healthy and doing well. Uh, so, you know, cancer period and to keep, keep a person to keep working and working. As they said with Bernie Mac, his last year, how he would come up and they had to put oxygen on him when him and Samuel Jackson was doing that movie. Uh, I forget the name of it. And you'd be surprised, but these were troopers and they wanted to, to do this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my prayers go out to the family of this young man, and uh, you know, and we'll remember him. Yeah. Um. Before we uh, go, the NBA they decided, you know, there was all this talk about whether or not they should resume the season, uh, especially being amidst the COVID nineteen and the racial pandemic, but they decided ultimately to do so, to only only to stop playing. How did you feel about them having the bubble? And do you think the impact was bigger because they started then stopped? I think the impact was bigger because they started and then stopped. Um, these, these guys are letting us know it's not, all, it's, it's not so much about money there than about health and mm -hmm. your life. Uh, uh, a lot of these guys, NBA contracts are guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Same way with Major League Baseball. Uh, we have to look and see now what the NFL is going to do because those contracts are not guaranteed. You know, uh, I take my hat off to them. They started, they didn't stop. These athletes are letting us know that there's more important things in life than playing ball, mm -hmm. than playing ball. Lives are at stake, you know, uh, uh, and it was a time, hey, well, I'll just keep playing, but wait a minute. And plus, you got to remember, too, a lot of these guys have got younger children. They're going to come a time you got to explain to your youngins what's going on. Mm -hmm. You see, I had to sit down and explain to my daughters about the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to sit down and explain to Jonathan and Ariana. When they say, Dad, why are they doing this? You, you just can't say, well, I don't know. Have you had to talk with your grandsons? I know you, how important they are to you. Um, you know, I know... Um, the oldest one is in his 30s, if yeah, I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. But, and then, you know, the youngest one is uh, really about to enter the college life. Can you talk about the first time you had that uh, African-American uh, male and policeman conversation with them? I sit down with Jerron, who's the oldest, and let him know, especially when he got out of high school and he went to college. Then when he got a job, I said, first of all, remember, here's the thing, do your job. Mm hmm do your job. Uh, uh, don't get involved in ridiculous conversations. You know, do your job. Uh, as far as the police is concerned, be careful. Do the right thing. Don't give them a chance. If you're pulled over and he comes to the car, yes, officer, wh what have I done? If he say you were speeding, 
Accept the ticket, go on about your business. You got two choices. You can fight it in court or you can pay the ticket. Now, if, if you're in a crowd and he comes in and he is disrespectful, just say, okay, officer, get his badge number. Report it. Get his badge number. You put wood on the fire, the fire is only going to get hot. And the way these policemen are now, not all of them are like them. The least little thing. And the first thing they'll say, well, I was protecting myself. How are you protecting yourself? You're shooting a guy in the back. Mm-hmm. When you shoot someone in the back, they're even trying to get away from you. What threat are they? And this is what needs to be learned. Respect the law, but also let the law respect you too. If I'm not doing anything wrong, you, and if you pull me aside and want to ask you, what did I do? You know, mm-hmm. and if I feel as though that, that, that you're going to get, you know, get out the car and this and that, I'm going to get out and say, well, can I ask you a question? Why? You see, why are you stopping me? They want you to give verbal verbal so they can use an excuse. And then some are just saying, go on. I've explained it to my, my oldest son, my youngest grandson, going on 17. I let him know now, be careful, watch what you do, be you know, alert. Don't give these people word for word because you're a young man. My Brian, and you know, I love you like grandson, like you like a son. These people fail to understand every black person killed, male killed, that's a generation that won't be fathered. Mm-hmm. We've got to, we've got to, you know, if they can make us extinct, bingo. But you, but, but you know, we believe in God. That ain't going to happen. But my thing is, so I've sit down and talked to them to let them know, do what you have to do, do your job. You know, uh, my mother used to always say, pick your friends. <laughs> I laugh at that now. Pick your friends. You know, pick who you hang around with. If you're in a group and you see something happen, walk away. You know, walk away. And I think this is it. Uh, we know now with the, a lot of places talking in cities, they're talking about defunding the police. Everybody cannot be smart enough or car- to carry a weapon. And that goes for the policemen. Everybody ain't smart enough to carry a weapon or shouldn't be allowed to carry a weapon. So the first thing happens is with some of these police, that's the first thing they think about. I'm sure their training does not resolve that. Mm-hmm. And you're not being threatened if the person is going away. Hey, let them talk. Words, words are cheap, mm-hmm. you see. And it hurts me to see our black young men not only being shot by the police, but killing each other. Black lives matter, my brothers. Please stop killing one another. Mm-hmm. Let's, live, let's get in peace and harmony. You know, and people like to say, well, you know, the police killing y'all. I mean, y'all, there's always outrage when the police kill, but what about when black people kill each other? You know, they, they like to use the term black on black crime. But the thing is, most of the time when a black person kills another black person, somebody go to jail. Yes. You yes. know, and it shouldn't happen. Yes. But somebody go to jail. Yes. The issue is that when the police kill us, they don't go to jail. They get paid time off. Yeah. Why should you get paid time off? And a book off? deal. Yeah. I mean, why should, you, why should I pay you? Because I'm a taxpayer mm-hmm. and you didn't kill somebody and you suspend it. Mm-hmm. Or they give you a job somewhere way back in, in the station counting paper clips, but there's a life land out there that doesn't have a chance, doesn't have a chance to make a living. Uh, uh, you know, also, they need to crack down also to, we have got to push to make our officials, our elected officials in this city and in this state more accountable, mm-hmm. you know, to do the right thing. You know, come on, man, what are you going to do? You, you got to you got to do better than this. When I was coming along, uh, um, policemen had respect, and we respected them. All the cops had to do is say, I'm going to take you home to your father. So, oh God, I'm dead. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because that's worse. <laughs> yeah, same, same thing in the school system. Uh-huh. All the teachers say, I'm going to send a letter home. Oh, Lord. Well, I won't see you because <laughs> my dad's going to kill me. We've got to get the respect back. But. In order to get respect, you have to earn respect. Mm-hmm. You see, you, you have to earn respect. You have to show respect to other people. Hopefully and prayerfully, 
Our new police commissioner, well, uh, uh, he's trying to do the best he can to weed down some things. But you still got these little small communities like, what's that, Anosha, Wisconsin? Mm -hmm. which is about Anosha. What, Anosha, about 30 miles from the city of Milwaukee. Yeah. <laughs> you see, what's the other place outside of Missouri where the young man was killed? Outside of St. Louis? Oh, um yeah, see, you got I, these, I the you got these small is. little areas. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so we really just got to, uh, and the police feel like now that they are the villains and everybody's against them. Well, you know, think sometimes. Uh, they're good policemen out here. But unfortunately, the bad ones shine, you know, shine in light more than the good ones. And that's what the people are doing. You know, you, you don't have to shoot nobody five or six times. You don't have to shoot them at once. You don't have to shoot them one time. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to make arrests, make the arrest. You got the stun gun, so what is the stun gun is used for? If you got a stun gun that, that, you know, at least drops them to their knees, why you got to shoot them? Exactly. So it's just. And at the end of the day, you know, they, we do, they are good police officers. They want uh, people to snitch in the hood, so they need to start snitching. If you see somebody doing something wrong, hold each other accountable. It's there, just like there, there you go. what we say about um, with everything going on with race and in these offices that you do have some of our white allies who will stand yes, up sir. and say, you know what, no, this black guy, I mean, they won't say it like that, but you know, he was right. Listen to him. Yes. He's intelligent. Yes. You know, Or give that person a chance. You never gave them a chance. So that's the thing. People got to just stand up and have those uncomfortable conversations and hold each other accountable. And unfortunately, you got a guy in the White House who promotes racism. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know a lot of people say, no, 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 promotes racism. Has the, has the country ever been this divided where you had somebody in the office going out and saying everything but hate all black people and Hispanic people? No. Okay. <laughs> Not in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said, I've been on this earth 78 years, going on 78. Uh, e even when I was old enough to remember presidents, you know, when uh, the Truman era who took over for Roosevelt, I was still a kid, Eisenhower. Uh, let me say this to you. I wasn't a fan of Ronald Reagan, but he, you did respect the office mm -hmm. of the presidency. I wasn't a big fan of the Bushes, but you respect the offices. They kept their distance sometimes, didn't speak out of things. This guy, every time you look, he's speaking out wrong. I've done more for the African Americans than any president. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 uh, you know, then he tries to make himself look good, goes across the street at the church with the Bible in his hand. The Bible is upside down. So that lets me know that he is not, you know, he's the antichrist. But what I'm saying is, no, never in my life since I can have I seen someone who has got this country this much divided, Brian. Uh, even with the civil rights era, you had the country some sort of uh, divided, but you had presidents who spoke out, mm -hmm. who said, you know, or his advisor said, look, we better get this done or we're going to have problems. And they did. They did. I mean, you know, Nixon was smart enough. <laughs> Stuff was going on. It, 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 they didn't call him Tricky Dick for nothing. <laughs> so he brought Sammy Davis Jr. to the White House, let him spend the night. Oh, okay. So that's to say, well, this guy likes black folks and this and that. But no, never, excuse me, have I seen anything like this in my life. I, and I'm oh, hoping and praying that this is taken care of. I got to ask you this last question, because um, I always wondered this. It seemed like the 60s was a time where black fought for equality and equal rights. When I look back, I see the 70s as a time where I see that's where a lot of the black culture was created and accepted, the TV shows, the music. And then, you know, it seems like we're back here. Did black people get too comfortable too fast in the 70s as opposed to keep fighting so that in 2020 we wouldn't be having it similar uh these same fights i think so okay. and remember i say that you come out of the 50s and the 60s like when blacks were in hollywood they had job brought this you know butlers and 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 chauffeurs uh uh in the late 60s and 70s we started taking over with shaft Superfly, you know, the black TV shows, Good Times, uh, uh, and other things. Blacks start getting roles. So they began to, to get comfortable. I even uh, got a little uh, 
things things about that. I felt as though the show Good Times was good, but I didn't like the idea of the way it was portrayed. Florida was a maid. James mm-hmm. worked at the car wash. Okay, but come on. You're living in the projects. Why couldn't you show something else? But the whole thing is television shows began. Blacks begin to get good roles in movies uh, instead of the slave roles and all that. And I think they became too comfortable. Then we had certain African-Americans who felt as though, well, I got it made. And, um, you know, Jay Simpson. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I can still be on the same level as the uh, Caucasian. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, and they got relaxed, and and then they began, like I said, uh, once they got, once Obama couldn't run again, uh, 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 they was the white man was saying, "Well, you had to, we're gonna show you some," and that's when they brought this guy in, and uh, was elected, and you saw the country be divided, uh, and we need to understand this. Yes, we got too relaxed. We begin to start making big money. Uh, uh, and we say, well, hey, you know, things are looking good. But look at the man who's not making good money, who is still struggling. Mm-hmm. When it all comes down, whether you're a multi-billionaire or not in this country, if your skin is dark, they still look upon you as, you know, n- not as good as them or mm-hmm. not on the same level. Yeah. That's the way I feel. They don't send Brian a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> this is me, Lorenzo <laughs> Coleman, if you want to send it to I mean. <laughs> Title to my opinion, and because uh, I know people, you know, but this is it. This is the way it is. Wow, man, Pop, I really appreciate you taking your time out your busy schedule. Hey, man, I appreciate you having me. <laughs> this was uh, I, I got you back in the radio seat. I know you used to yeah. do some radio. So <laughs> hello, but, yeah, but I thank you, and I appreciate what you're doing. You're bringing up a lot of topics on your podcast, which is good. They, some things people don't want to touch, but you got to touch everything. Yeah. In order, in order for people. Remember one thing: the idea during slavery time, and on up to, in the twenties and thirties, if you kept a black person ignorant, you could control him. Mm-hmm. You see, we and I'm gonna end on this: we, when our children are babies, we have to teach them. You, when your daughter and John to a little babies, you have to let them know that this color is white on the wall. You have to tell them this is A, this is B, you know. So that's where it was back then. You keep a person ignorant, you'll control them. And the reason why a lot of people back then didn't want us to learn anything because then you could see, wait a minute, you're trying to pull, no, this ain't right. This ain't right. Even with our Constitution, the minute you start talking about something, they start looking for a way to amend it. Mm-hmm. Amend it. Thank you so much, young man. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm going to have to get you back on here oh, again. Oh, definitely. <laughs> if, they, if they don't run me out of town. <laughs> Just joking. They won't. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, that is... Uh, breaking through the glass ceilings with uncomfortable conversations as we discuss sports sports and activism. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Go on Apple Podcasts. Drop a five-star rating. Share it with your friends. Share it with everybody that you know. If uh, you don't have an iPhone, you can still get it on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Anchor. Until the next time, do not let anybody set up a ceiling that you can't break through. The podcast is brought to you by Be Waters Productions. It is produced and edited by myself, Brian H. Waters, with the music brought to you by Hypnosis. You can find Hypnosis on Instagram at hypno underscore beats.